Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Uva Brandis. I'm the executive director of the uh, master's program in urban and regional planning. And welcome to the sixth uh, of our speaker series this fall, the inaugural speaker, speaker series. Uh, today, uh, we move from Montgomery County to Northern Virginia. And uh, we're, we're uh, greatly honored and pleased to have representatives from the Northern Virginia Regional Commission here. Um, Mark Gibb, who will join us uh, shortly, uh, is, uh, is in transit. And we're uh, delighted to have uh, his deputies, uh, both Steve Walls and uh, Ken Billingsley, uh, join us to, to commence the, uh, the, 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 the presentation. And uh, I just want to start off by saying <clears throat> the Northern Virginia Regional Commission really is a coordinating body uh, that uh, coordinates between many, many different government entities and has really been at the heart of leveraging um, the historic uh, uh, concentration of, of jobs in, in the federal government in a kind of transformation, very dynamic, uh, uh, that leverages all kinds of private investment and private economic development in, in Northern Virginia. So to help us learn about this story, um, Steve Walls, uh, thank you very much for, thank for joining you. us today. Very glad to be here. And I apologize that Mark is a little late. He got off a plane from Turkey a little bit ago and is on the highway on his way down here. I think probably the highway since the Silver Line hasn't made it out to Dulles yet. Um, and so he will be here though, um, at least by the question and answer time, if not earlier. Um, and he has um, gone through, and these are the slides that we, that we worked with him on, so they're his slides. I hope that we can give a, um, a reasonable approximation of what he was gonna say to you here. Um, Uva, thank you very much again for the invitation to be part of the series. It's a great series, the people that you have through. Um, so the Northern Virginia Regional Commission, as he mentioned, covers um, um, about um, three or four percent of the land area in Virginia and has about 40 percent of the population um, and about 40 percent of the economy. It's 14 cities, counties, and towns. It's got 2.6 million, 2.3 to 2.6, depending on how far out you measure, of the people in the, in the larger greater Washington metro area here. Um, our board is made up of lo local elected officials from the 14 county cities and towns that make up our area. The small towns participate, but not, we don't build them so that we don't count them as members. Um, and we're one of 21 regional commissions across the Commonwealth. Um, if you're from other states, um, they can be council of governments, they can be regional commissions. Some states don't have them. West Virginia, they're affiliated with the um, um, Appalachian Regional Council and they're, um, I forget what they're called, called up in West Virginia. So they have different names in different places. And we're similar to the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments that covers the, the Virginia, Washington DC and Maryland area. We work with them on a lot of projects, but we really try and focus in on the unique things that, the, of Northern Virginia. We're a Dillon rule state. Um, Maryland's a home rule state. DC is a um, congressional rule state. I'm not sure what you'd describe that as. Um, Dillon rule is really, we only have the authority, localities only have the authority to do things directly um, authorized by our General Assembly or reasonably required to, to do under the, under the regular powers that they have. Unlike home rule that really generally, these are not black and white, but have the um, ability to do things unless the legislature tells them um, no. I think as we'll talk about, and as Eva mentioned, we are really the um, economic driver of the area. And one of the things that we do as a group is try and work to help gain consensus. We, we're really a safe place for people, to, the localities, to come and meet and deal with problems of greater than local significance is, I think, the technical term in the Regional Cooperation Act in Virginia state law that sets us up. Um, so we're gonna split this up into two different sections. First, Ken is gonna come up now and talk a little bit about some of the demographic factors and economic factors that differentiate us from the rest of the region and really the rest of the country. Um, and then we'll talk, I'll come back up and talk a little bit about some of the types of things that we're doing um, to marshal these demographic trends that, that Ken is talking about. So Ken, uh, and it's Ken Billingsley. He's been with the commission for th over 30 since years. Since 1978, so he's That's seen a lot of, uh, so, so as you'll see some of the numbers in here, he's seen a lot of change and, um, and brings a really long tenure and history to, um, to this information. So thank you, Ken. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. I actually grew up in Pittsburgh in a little neighborhood that uh, 
never seen the change. And then we moved here, and it's, it's been such a whirlwind. Uh, the total transformation of the suburbs and, uh, and, and uh, uh, that is ongoing today. And uh, it's been exciting. Uh, I have worked as, as the director of, of, of demographics and information services. And at one time, I was a research uh, director. So I've had a front seat view of just an extraordinary history. Uh, I start by emphasizing the point that a proximity to the nation's capital has uh, transformed uh, Northern Virginia and the entire uh, Washington metropolitan area into one of America's and the world's most dynamic, fastest growing, economically advanced, uh, highly educated, prosperous, and culturally diverse regions on the planet. What is the legacy of living adjacent to the nation's capital, of being the beneficiary of more than a half century of federal government expansion and a sustained economic growth? Uh, one, of the, one is a history of a robust population growth among the most impressive in the United States uh, during the post-war era. Like a water faucet turned on and uh, left running forcefully for 60 years, uh, Northern Virginia uh, has been adding people at a healthy and a sustained way, rate. Uh, this decade uh, recorded the largest population increase in other regions history, a gain of 415,000. Northern Virginia's population increase last, last decade was more than that occurring in 35 of 50 American states and accounted for 45% of a Virginia's a decennial increase. And uh, the elections that we're seeing, uh, the results in, in both the past two presidential elections, the recent governor's election, uh, they have been driven by Northern Virginia. The outcome is the result of uh, Northern Virginia. And uh, there's been sl no slowdown in our population growth to date. The latest census estimates uh, have the region adding 115,000 uh, during the first uh, two years of the new decade, a, a number that exceeds the population growth figure of 39 states uh, during that period. If uh, Northern Virginia were a separate MSA, it would rank among the 25 largest in the United States in, in a population size. And uh, this is from a total of 366 metros. And among the top 15 in a population growth uh, uh, since the 2000 census. A, a second legacy of a living where we do, a, another defining demographic attribute is the role that immigration has played uh, over the past three decades. Northern Virginia has become one of the great immigrant gateways of the United States, a, a global talent magnet uh, that has been attracting people and talent uh, from all corners of the globe. 86% of the population growth in nor Northern Virginia over the past two decades has come from increases in its Asian, uh, Hispanic, and other uh, minority population groups. Today, 40% of the region's youth, 18 years of age and under, live in a home in which one or both parents are foreign born. In almost a third of Northern Virginia homes, English is not the primary language spoken. New York, America's quintessential immigrant city, had 41% foreign born when it reached an all-time high, or an all-time peak in a 1910. Immigrants now make up fully a, a, a quarter of Northern Virginia's population. It's not of the same magnitude as a New York or a New York City a century ago, but for a post-World War II, a suburban region, it's an extraordinary journey. And no one or two countries uh, dominate the flow as they do in most other places. Only New York has an immigrant population as diverse as uh, that found here. And the third demographic attribute I want to highlight and emphasize is an asset 
that perhaps more than any other is what sets the region apart. It's its, it's unparalleled a human capital. We have a population and a workforce whose education, income, and occupational profile on all the standard measures used to define these categories places us in the top one percentile nationally at the very top of the nation. And I always like to think, you know, for students, like if you were taking your college boards or if you were taking your law admissions test or medical school admissions test, and if you were in the top one percentile, uh, you were in very select category. And, and uh, you really stood out. There are 3,143 counties and independent cities in the United States. Six of the mo uh, 30 most highly educated, as measured by a percentage of adults with college degrees and those with advanced degrees, are located in uh, Northern Virginia. In absolute numbers, uh, the Washington area has as many people with advanced degrees as Los Angeles and, and Chicago, despite vast differences in our population size among these three markets. Actually, let me just run. There's, oh, okay, I'll get this, this one in a second. Uh, some writers have begun uh, referring to the D.C. area as America's second city. Uh, an acknowledgement of the, of the area's growing importance, influence, and role nationally, and of the abundant supply of highly educated people and workers uh, who reside here. And of course, one byproduct is overall income levels uh, that also stand out nationally. Uh, with six, once again, six of the nine Northern Virginia uh, jurisdictions ranking among the top 1% nationally on median household income, uh, per capita income, median family income, and percent of households with incomes 150,000 and above. Uh, these are very impressive statistics. And these are just a few of the charts that show it. Uh, and it's not just in national comparisons uh, that uh, the place of Northern Virginia stands out. This is a chart uh, that was uh, prepared. Actually, I want to go back a second. I'm having... uh, w w one point I want to make after I was, you know, showing you some of the, uh, you know, charts that showed the rankings on income and education. Uh, America's economic landscape, uh, Richard Florida argues, it's being reshaped today around two kinds of hubs, centers of knowledge and ideas and clusters of energy production. These are the places driving uh, the economic recovery and it is around these two economic agglomerations uh, that America's uh, emerging growth model can be found. It is the knowledge metros, large and small, Florida argues, uh, that make up the biggest group of winners in uh, today's economy. And uh, we're in the forefront of this group. And uh, this is a chart uh, by Dr. Fuller. And they show, once again, the dynamism of Northern Virginia. Uh, it also, we also have become the driver of the national capital region's uh, economy. According to Fuller, uh, over the last 40 years, uh, we have grown from slightly more than 25% of the region's eco economy to now about 50%, uh, surpassing both the relative percentages in uh, the district and Maryland suburbs. And, and Dr. Uh, Fuller projects that we will continue to be the leading economic force, uh, home to 50% of employment growth uh, in the greater uh, metropolitan uh, region. We're living during a period of historic transition in the United States and in Northern Virginia, a period in which powerful demographic, economic, technological, global, 
and metropolitan trends forces are converging. About three years ago, I think it's about, about three, three, three years ago, uh, the Brookings Institution, in a landmark study, identified five new realities uh, that herald the coming of a new age in America, or what they call the pathway uh, to America's next society. These are the uh, realities. Uh, uneven population growth among metropolitan regions of the country, separating places that are growing and thriving from those that are declining or merely struggling to hold their own. Population diversification, the transition to a day when there will no longer be a racial or ethnic majority in the United States, which is happening at an accelerated pace in uh, some places. Uh, aging of the population, one of the great megatrends of our time, which is not just a matter of caring for people as they grow older, uh, but which has huge uh, workforce uh, ramifications. Uneven educational attainment among segments of the population and among metropolitan regions uh, with attendant consequences not only for the well-being of individuals, uh, but for metropolitan economies as well and income inequality. Northern Virginia and the larger Washington metropolitan area of which it is a part are on the leading edge of the economic and demographic upheaval taking place. The uh, Brookings Institution labeled the DC metro area as a, a new frontier metro. One of a handful of metros across the United States that are thriving and are growing and to whom uh, by virtue of the concentration of human capital, the abundance of brains they possess must show and lead uh, the way forward for the rest of the nation in dealing with all these uh, new realities. While Northern Virginia obviously has economic and uh, demographic assets uh, exceeding uh, those found in most uh, places, uh, we will need all the brain power uh, we can muster and the cooperation of government, of the business community, and academic in uh, institutions in this region to tackle uh, the formidable array of challenges that exist today and will be confronting us in the years ahead. Uh, these are a list of them. I won't go through them, uh, only to mention you know, one or two. Uh, we, as we all know, we have some of the most congested roadways, subways, and buses in the, in the nation. Affordable housing is making it more and more difficult for young workers, for our growing immigrant population, and many others to find housing. It's a great concern in finding the workforce that we will need in the future. The workforce issue, uh, there's the potential in increasingly a great deal being written on the coming shortage of workers and skills in the workplace as uh, the massive exodus of baby boomers from the workplace uh, takes place and, uh, and, and on and on and on. Uh, we won't go on uh, and, and uh, describe them in further though if you have any questions so uh, we can certainly address them later. Now I'd like to turn it over to Steve, who's going to talk about some of the things that are going on uh, to take advantage of both the assets we have and also to deal with some of the really challenging problems we have. Thanks, Ken. Um, that always amazes me when I see all those lists that were one, two, three, six, seven, eight, and things on those compared to the other areas around the country. Um, I spent, I didn't say anything about myself really, I spent 31 years in Richmond um, in the rest of Virginia, I guess is what some people call it. Um, you yeah, Northern Virginia and the rest of Virginia, although down in Richmond they don't necessarily like that as much. But um, 
Um, the old dominion. The old dominion, yes, yes. Um, working for the state. And so coming up here and the Dionysism that happens in Northern Virginia is just really, really something. Particularly, I was, the, I was last the um, agency head of the agency that regulates all the mining and mineral extraction. So we have our largest offices out 10 miles from the Kentucky state line, out in the mountains in Appalachia, working south side and other places like that. Um, and it really is just an amazing place. And, it, and, and the fact on how it drives the economy of the whole greater Washington metropolitan region is really something. Those slides from Dr. Fuller, they started to stop. The first one stops in 2009, and D.C. is turning back up. There's been a lot of growth and things here in D.C. that's starting there. But we've got such, <coughs> such amount of momentum going in Northern Virginia. And um, as we'll talk about a couple of things, some of the things that are happening are really going to be driving it. And it will be, um, we'll be moving ahead very, very quickly. So I think some of those projections moving forward of the growth I think will tend to be true. Projections, you know, the only thing that you can guarantee about a projection that it's going to be wrong, the only question is how right or wrong it's going to be. And so well, I think those are probably pretty close. Um, time will tell as we go ahead. So what do we do to try and um, manage this dynacism and move forward here? One of the things that we've done that has been fairly unique um, and it different than a lot of other places is build these synergies with international areas. We realize that we're really competing with these areas. And so we need to think about what they're doing and how we can be as good as they are or better than they are. But we also can learn from them and they can learn from us. And so while it's some competition, we've really tried to build a good relationship. We've had more than a 10 year, probably about a 14 year relationship with the regional commission in, this, in Stuttgart, Germany. And looking at that, we went through a real process to, to look at who are somewhat similar to us in size and growth rates and other things in education levels. And that matched up very well. Um, we've also, um, in, in more recent years, as everybody else has, reached out to Asia. Um, South Korea is just one of these places that is just, again, th that has really grown. In 1970, South Korea had a smaller GDP than North Korea. And look at it today. It's the sixth largest economy in the world. When you think about things like that, you know, you, you hear about China all the time, but there's other things out there that are just amazing like this. Um, so we have found that we can, um, and really in many cases, have implemented these best practices that we've picked up from around the world. Um, and so we, um, we feel like that um, um, we've been able to, to move forward um, quite well with that, with that area. Um, the, um, and I'm going to try and get back here on, my, on, the, on the right numbered slides here as I go along. Um, one thing that actually that struck us as we've been doing this is the quote that's up there from, he, he was one of the officials in the Stuttgart area. We think about, well, what can we learn from some place like China, from South Korea, from Germany, from France, from England, from the Netherlands, um, from Finland. We just had a group of transportation officials here from Finland through. And it was amazing how exactly the same things we're dealing with are the same problems they're dealing with. Now, their governmental systems are going to differ a little bit from ours, but it's really the same problems. And really, many of the same things, same solutions are being developed. We're working on infrastructure banks, public-private partnerships. With the military, there's something now that's called the public-public partnership that is out there that if you look at what the Army is doing, they're pushing that hard. The Navy's done a little bit of that. Um, they're looking at doing the same types of things. Um, and so this type of, of, um, of joint work um, with these international partners has been very important. And, and what, is, what have we really gotten there out of it within the energy area? Um, the whole concept of community energy planning that is being used um, in Northern Virginia and really other places around the U.S. and Canada, um, Holland, Michigan, Guelph, Ontario, Canada, and others, came out of work that we did at the German Embassy a number of years ago. Um, we were fortunate enough to have these connections that we were one of the, one of the founding um, groups for the transatlantic climate bridge between Germany and the United States. And so um, we're, we're really blessed with when, the, when a lot of these folks come over to Washington, we're right on the doorstep again, as Ken talked about. So they're all going to come out and talk with us, um, ranging from the environment minister for the EU, Connie Heldegren, who was out here last year, and just other people like that all the time are coming through, particularly on the energy things. Um, in Arlington County, they have taken that and run with it. They now have a community energy plan as a chapter of their comprehensive plan. They adopted it earlier this year. And so just like they have open space plans and uh, they have just a plethora of plans, really, they now have energy plan as part of that. Um, 
you know, things like green roofs are something that um, a lot of the folks, um, the officials from this area, when they f f 10, 15 years ago started going over to Europe and started seeing some of those and then realized these are the types of things that we need to be able to ready, be ready to foster here. And so they got their planning departments in their, in their building um, plan approval folks to understand what these were. And while Chicago may have passed it for a while, the D.C. area had, and this is kind of little known, D.C. area had a higher percentage of green roofs than any place in the country. Because again, they were leading and they, they made it possible for these things to happen. Uh, district energy systems is something that has been, they, they were used in the U.S. in a lot of the northeastern cities. New York City still has an old aging steam system that people are continuing trying to work on upgrading. Got a call just uh, yesterday actually from somebody who's working on some of those systems. Um, uh, but we really went away from district energy systems. And so a lot of folks from our region have gone back and looked at places like that little, the box there in the middle of the screen is a district heating and system and um, power generation system in Schoenhauser Park outside of Stuttgart. Um, runs 24 hours a day. It's low enough um, pressure. They don't have to have it staffed 24 hours a day. Um, and so these types of things are moving ahead um, in, in Arlington. They have now have done an integrated energy master plan for the Crystal City area. And so they, as that is going to be rebuilt, as they're digging up the streets for the trolleys and the BRT that are going to be going up there, they'll be putting the pipes in the ground to be able to do these types of district energy systems. There'll be a big cooling loop and some, and some heating loops and things. Um, looking at um, transportation, you know, little things like the signs everybody now sees at the metro that says the next train is so many minutes. That happened because of some of these officials were traveling in Germany and Stuttgart and in Berlin and they saw those signs and they said, wow, you know, it's like, why don't we have that? So they happened to be also on Emma's board and so they came back and a couple, you know, a year or so later we had them started to be put into the system here. So it's these little things that really can, this inter these international things have brought out. Some of the traffic calming types of things, just like use of traffic circles. Um, other parts of the country use them, but they kind of saw modern uses of tra uh, traffic circles. Um, so now things like the, um, the um, Hunter Mills Road traffic calming circle project in Fairfax County kind of came directly out of these experiences that they're doing. Um, the whole idea of the trolleys that are going to be, I guess, online in D.C. pretty soon, and they're, you know, it seems like every city is trying, a big city is trying to build some trolleys now. But the acceptance here came through people seeing them on our travels. In the environmental area, um, a lot of open space types of planning and, and tools have come over. Um, the Stuttgart area has done a really interesting thing with their climate atlas of the whole area, and they look at use of open space for many, many different things. Um, and so we looked at some of those tools. The one to the right is Emscher Park through the Ruhr Valley in Germany. This is the old steel and coal mining area. Um, and besides having some trails and things, they've knitted all the open space together. Those really inform the work that we've done to build the series of conservation corridors that cross the county and city lines. And so we can think about these landforms more broadly across the region and have the, the local plans knit together to be able to um, have these types of connectivity points um, across our area. Uh, we had a, um, a professional planner from the Netherlands with us for about six or seven months looking at the Room for the River program in the Netherlands. And shortly after she left, um, she got out before Superstorm Stan Sandy. Um, but quite a few of those folks have come back and have been working up through the Northeast with, um, uh, with the responses to Superstorm Sandy. So big things like that. And little things just like the type of use of swales for water control, stormwater control and things all came out of these types of things. Airports are something we're looking at now. Dulles Airport um, and National Airport and BWI together have about 60 million passengers a year or so. And it's about 22 in Dulles, 21 in, um, in National, and they move around a little bit and, and then the rest in, um, um, in BWI. But we look at the types of development that are occurring around the airports and now with the Silver Line coming out to, to um, Dulles, we've got this opportunity. So we really need to learn from that. And this is one of the latest areas that I'll talk a little bit about. This idea of this international outreach is really also very important for the economy. 
the foreign direct investment, now, now these are Virginia state numbers, but with for, being 40% of the economy of, of the state, a lot of this is in Northern Virginia. But you just look at the type of investment from companies from these areas. Over this four year period, there was $1.3 billion invested in Virginia from Germany, about a billion dollars from Japan and these other countries. And I think it's interesting, but it also tells us that I don't see places like the Central American communities or Korea, South Korea, et cetera, that we have a lot of people living in our region from. And so this also shows us where we have some of the opportunities to be able to reach out and do some more. Um, but it's really interesting to think about the, the effect that it has on our economy. And again, with the population coming from all over the, all over the world, it is, it, it is really quite something. Um, I mentioned the airports also. Um, and I think it's really interesting now that we're finally getting the silver line out there. Um, I think some, a lot of people don't realize in 1960s, when they, in the early 60s, when they built, began to build the highway out there, and this picture shows when they were adding the toll lanes in, and I can't remember, I guess that was maybe early 70s or so when they were doing that. They left the median in there in the 1960s for the train, so they envisioned the silver line in the 1960s, and it's only taken us 50 years to get there, but better late than never. Um, um, but again, it is the international gateway. Um, when this metro line goes out there, it is just going to be amazing to see the development. In Tyson's area, a year ago, there was 45 million square feet of development um, applications on the planning and zoning department's desks. And everybody was wanting to be first out of the block. Nobody, everybody couldn't be first out of the block. And so those guys were, uh, and, and women were really under quite a bit of pressure to get it done. Um, national is, Reagan National is, you know, you can see my age calling it just national, um, is just minutes from DC and the metro. It is at the anchor to Crystal, Crystal City. Um, and there's a concept that has come about fairly recently about these that people talk about these as aerotropolises or airport cities. Um, John Casarda out of UNC, um, Chapel Hill is one of the big um, people who kind of push this. And they point to us as one of the prime examples of this. I'm not sure that that's quite right. I think it can be, and we've got some work to do to get it there. But it's interesting to see how it really has been an anchor of our growth and then will continue to be. And if you look at where the growth is, it's really strung along. It's a kind of set of pearls along from outside of Dulles in Loudoun County, where there are more data centers than you can imagine. Um, it used to be a couple of years ago, 50% of the internet traffic in the world flowed through those data centers in Loudoun County. Probably still does. Um, don't know if the NSA things are going to make some countries pull their data, um, data systems into their own countries or not. It can cut both ways since the NSA has seemingly been listening to those data centers too. Um, but it's an amazing thing out there. Um, equivalent of three power plants worth of electricity being used in the data, you know, kind of average size gas-fired power plants being used in the data centers out there. And then you look at um, from Dulles all the way through to National, and then the Route 1 quarter and a couple of other areas are where all, these, all this development is happening. The Silver Line is really quite the project um, at $5.6 billion. Um, it is going to be this economic development driver. Again, I mentioned all of the work around, um, around um, Tyson's that is going to go in there. Um, it's working through the various phases. Um, and again, we mentioned the airport. And how can we knit together these plans? We've got EMA with its master plan. We've got Fairfax County with the Route 28 sector plan. We've got Loudoun County with its Eastern Loudoun County plans. And really, they have not been talking to each other. Um, folks in Loudoun recently came to the airport and said, well, we want to put a road right through where you've got one of your parking lots right now. We'll pay to move your parking lot. But it would have sterilized part of the um, airport property. It never would have been able to get to it across this road that would have been put in there. So the, the airport said, no, we really can't really do that. So one of the things we've started is to bring the three principals together with their staffs. And I think it was Chairman York from Loudoun County talks about we need to get to a tri-vision plan. This won't be a formal government plan. There's a approved by the bodies, but it'll be the type of thing that will help define these areas and allow us to work together to get the types of growth that we're going to see out there and allow us to deal with the historic nature of the Sarin um, designed um, um, terminal out at Dulles that we can't even put something that is going to um, block the view as you're driving around the loop as you come into the airport. So there's some real challenges out there that we'll have to deal with, but we will. Um, and so we're going to do three phases of this. We're first bringing the internal folks together, then we'll reach out to the business community um, because there's going to be issues of competition on the airport property with what goes on on the outside of the airport. You know, two stops up 
of the, of the silver line as it's going to go out. They're proposing to build a whole convention center and things. Does it make sense to do there or should we do that right on the airport property and then use that, the, the property outside of there um, for other purposes? We're going to have to deal with things that, uh, you know, since it's a federal property, um, the locals really don't get the tax revenues from things that are happening on the airport property itself. And so we're going to have to wrestle with some of these types of things. Um, there's 26 years left in the 50-year lease at the airport, so we can't do a long-term land lease for a developer on the airport property in order to be able to get things done like they're doing in Dallas-Fort Worth or Denver or places like that today. And so we've got some real challenges that we're going to have to work together, but we can look to international um, experiences as we talked about, whether it's um, on the left is an area outside of Stuttgart Airport, I'm excuse me, Frankfurt's Airport, where it was an old rail switchyard that's now being developed into this amazing place. The right is, um, is um, Sungdo, or actually it's Inchon Airport, and, and the Sungdo development that um, Gale International is doing there is just a, a phenomenal place, both with the technology they're putting in and, and everything else that they're, that they're doing. Um, and the other thing that we're going to need to struggle with, and actually I'd love to reach out to the folks here at Georgetown and the planning program for, is getting the types of metrics and quantitative performance benchmarks that we're going to need to really understand that we're doing things right. And they're going to have to cover all the main areas that we normal, normally cover. And we can get soft things about quality of life and all, but really to measure things is when things change is when they're measured, when you can provide that. So we'd love to try and work with you over the time and have some, and have some work going on about what are the best metrics that really do measure this over time. Um, well, so in talking about kind of synergies between space, we need to think about other types of transportation too. And so a couple of other things we're working on, we just released um, a market assessment as to whether we can now use the Potomac River as a, uh, as a system of transportation. We think that there's right now six routes that have potential. If we can deal with funding the land side, docks and parking or something that may be needed, we think in a two year period or so that those sites will be self-supporting and will not need subsidy, which is rare for a form of transit. Again, it'll need some subsidy for the land side things. One of the keys is, is if we can get some east-west things going and maybe get into Fort Belvoir, get into Quantico, so people from Maryland don't have to drive up, go across the Wilson Bridge and then drive all the way back down. I think it's 40% of the traffic heading north on I-95 in the morning is related to the military, to the Pentagon, to Quantico, to Fort Myer, other things like that. It's a phenomenal amount of traffic that if we can try and deal with that, we can begin to deal with or better deal with some of these transportation uh, challenges we have. We also, and, and we just did finally get it, or not finally, but we just did get it um, designated as a marine, under the Marine Highway Program, so we'll be able to get, hopefully get some federal dollars. It's a little hard in the budget. New technology, new tools are coming along. A lot of us, you know, we're, we've moved from the car to the smartphone as a form of transportation, I think is what some people like to say. So we've got these real-time ride sharing, we've got the apps. Um, um, one interesting thing that we've done to deal with the issues, again, of the military, we've set up a, a, a real-time ride sharing program just for the military so they can get on the bases, they can deal with the security issues and all of that. And, and it's really just a ride matching service on a smartphone. The other thing that used to happen is everybody used to come north, but now with things moved around after the last BRAC base realignment and closure process, things are moving north and south. You've got Mark Center, so you've got people moving around in a lot of different patterns, and technology can help us deal with those, and so we need to think about that as we go along and use these tools. So that gives us a sense a little bit about what we've been doing about our region. Um, I hope that has given you some sense at least and um, the dynamism of it. And, and I think uh, Mark hasn't made it, so we can't turn all the questions over to him. But I think we can take some, we'd be glad to take questions and have a little bit of a discussion about, about the region and, and, and how it relates to what you're studying. And That's phenomenal. Let's <laughs> Any questions? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I was just curious at the end there, the Potomac River Ferry system, uh, what kind of, I guess, end points, start points uh, would that be right there? Yeah. We're talking about going from southeast D.C. to National Airport and southwest D.C. to National Airport. Um, the same two points down to Old Town and Alexandria. Um, one, and there's some talk as to whether or not that could be able to make it up to uh, Georgetown also. Um, and so... Georgetown is, you know, a bit isolated, except for maybe the, um, the what's the bus that kind of run the the, um, the circulator, yeah. Um, 
And then the other ones that are looking at, again, are dealing with the east-west getting across the river. Those are the ones that, getting river crossings and not so much as much up and down the river are the key ones. And so, for example, from Alexandria to, um, Air, um, to um, um, Andrews Air Force Base, um, 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 and Joint Base um, Andrews, I guess, on the other side of the river, again, to keep people from making this big loop. Um, and then the, um, so the two from the airport, two from um, um, Old Town, and then uh, a couple that are coming up the river and kind of getting across the Potomac to the Maryland side are, are where they are right now. Again, we think though that if we can deal with security, some really short, just east-west routes. For example, if you were just across the river from Belvoir, you could set up a secure access point on the Maryland side you can put some parking over there because there's no transit over in that part of Maryland and be able to move people over. And there's now more people working on Fort Belvoir than in the Pentagon with the changes there. Plus the hospital down there. So one third of the hospital that was up in Maryland, um, uh, um, I forget now, the one that they closed up there. One th pardon? Walter Reed. Walter Reed, yeah. One third of that moved down to Fort Belvoir and two thirds of that moved over to the alternate location in Maryland. So there's a whole new hospital that wasn't there. So not only, and that's where they're doing a lot of the long-term rehabilitation of soldiers and sailors and airmen and things. Um, and so people are there for quite a long while. Their families are in the area coming in there every day to see them. Or a lot of them are off-site and coming there every day for, their, for the therapy that they're getting. Um, and so, again, that east-west river crossing, one of the problems is, is that if you were to go out on the river in a boat right now, today, they'll chase you away because there's some things going on right on the hillside above the river that they don't really, um, that aren't real public. Um, and so, again, security is a real concern there, and um, they're dealing with a lot of other things, but this is, I think, a real potential. And again, things got moved down to Marine Corps Base Quantico. Um, and again, that could be an east-west traffic um, flow. So those are the next two that we're going to work hard on. Yeah, go ahead. What are some of the successful ways that you've seen the region addressing the affordable housing issue in the area? Yeah, um, with the with the um, with the um, Arlington um, um, vote yesterday not to create a housing authority. Um, um, but but I, I can understand that. Um, I think that. Um, Creating a housing authority kind of creates another level, and I think Arlington has the capability to do it without an authority. And so I'm not sure that that was necessarily the best thing um, to be able to do it. Uh, it's a big challenge. Um, Uva and I, and we were talking a little bit beforehand, and I'm wondering if we're really going to be going through, and some of the transformation that Kent's talking about, are we going to be going through another change? almost looking like some of, say, the, you know, Paris, some of the French and European cities, where we end up with this ring of lower income folks around the outside who can't afford it. And then inside, we're going to have higher educated, higher income, um, more, you know, kind of more culturally uh, attuned, so who are going to use the amenities that are, that are in the cultural areas. I'm not sure that we maybe aren't heading that direction some, and it's going to be a real challenge. Um, I lived, go ahead. But the thing is, uh, one of the things we saw last decade was uh, a, a, a demographic inversion that was contrary to any pattern that uh, historically had uh, defined settlement patterns in the suburbs. Uh, the settlement had always been, uh, first it had been moving outward and uh, so forth, and uh, the uh, people with higher incomes uh, were moving outward. Uh, and, and especially places like uh, Lyon County, for example. And uh, then, uh, last decade, we suddenly see, and some of it was driven by the uh, overheated housing market, that we saw um, uh, a massive movement of people with lower incomes, pre pre predominantly immigrant and, and uh, groups like that. And, uh, and it happened so rapidly. I actually had the experience of somewhere around 2000, I, I was given a talk to all the county managers, all the county executives, and I uh, said that if current trends continue, we could see the outer suburbs being the first uh, localities in Northern Virginia to become a majority minority. And the county executive from uh, Prince William jumped all over 
And he said, how can you say this? This is outrageous. This is not going to happen. That's exactly what happened. And in 15 years' time, some of the outer suburbs, like for, for example, of Prince William Manassas, Manassas Park, their school systems went from 70, uh, thir well, I, I mean, the terminology, I don't like the terminology minority majority and all that. Uh, and uh, that's going to be changing and uh, stuff like that. Uh, but uh, they went from 30% minority to 70% in 15 years' time. And some of the, the contentious issues that arose in the outer suburbs were related to the change was so quick and so rapid that uh, it just sort of knocked people off their feet. And uh, so it ended up. Uh, but, but now we're seeing as the new decade starts, uh, we're seeing a very significant reconfiguration of the suburbs. In fact, books are being written at the end of the suburbs because uh, they're becoming much more complex, diverse. The whole structure is undergoing change. And uh, so we've really entered a whole new era. era. And uh, I, I actually, uh, last night was in a meeting in Alexandria. I'm on a group to help them. They've had explosive enrollments in the inner suburbs, uh, Arlington and uh, Alexandria. They began, uh, from 2000 to 2005, their enrollments were declining, but public school enrollments. And suddenly then, they have seen enrollment increases last seen uh, during the baby boom years. They haven't seen these increases, and suddenly the schools are bursting at the seams, and they're saying, what's going on? Is this the new normal? Can anyone explain this to me? They're having to redraw all the boundaries. And it's all part of, but they're also concerned because there's very significant evidence of gentrification. And uh, uh, like especially Arlington has been very dramatic. Less so in Alexandria because the composition of their households or, or, housing, or their housing unit uh, uh, mix is very different. But it's, uh, it, there are a lot of people scratching their heads and saying, when's this turmoil you know, going to settle down so we know what the heck's going on? One of the things, Alexandria is about 50% um, rental, 50% homeowners, um, which is kind of an interesting mix. You know, you, Loudoun is going to be much, much, much heavier. Um, Prince William will be heavier um, homeowners. So there's a lot of rental stock out there. Um, a lot of the growth now across the region is being pushed towards the mixed use, kind of medium high rise types of centers. And those are going to be relatively high income types of places. I live just a block away from the um, Potomac Yards. It used to be the railroad, now it's the big box stores. And now they're starting the development. And if they get the infill metro station in there, it'll be full of about 10, 15 story buildings, mixed use and everything. Um, in the first four of those buildings, are uh, two are going up and two are about to go up, so it started. So if we can do that, we can then try and preserve some of the other housing that is a little bit more affordable around. It's not going to be the ones that are walkable to the metros. It may have to take a two or a three seat ride to get to where you're going, which I think is a really interesting type of thing that we got to deal with. How many seats do you have to get on to use transit and how long is it going to take you? Um, but, um, you know, DC here, what the, their, their goal is to have 70% of the trips to be not in a single family passenger car. Um, when we now compare the inner suburbs, Arlington and Alexandria and DC together, to what we see in Europe, we have as high a non single family um, car commute uh, use rate as cities like Stuttgart, Germany. So we actually are doing much better there than, than a lot of times we give ourselves credit for. Um, you know, just things like the capital bike share and what it's done to people, uh, because we've, in, we've improved the infrastructure so much in Northern Virginia, parts of Northern Virginia at least, um, in, in, in the district, parts of, of Maryland. Um, but it's growing. For example, the new uh, parking structure they're putting out at the, um, at the Reston uh, Metro stop has got, a physical bike storage room um, part of the parking structure. 
Um, and so they're building these types of things. They're, they're developing the plans right now to, as they're redoing Tysons, to be able to build bicycles into, into that, um, what will be an edge city urban infrastructure of 100,000 people and 300,000 workers in the next, say, 20 years or so. Um, so all of that's going on, if we can, but if we can keep that there and if we can do some things to be able to provide the type of support, you know, Section 8 housing, if, you, if it's still called that, is an important thing and we need to, th so there's a lot, it's going to be driven by national types of trends also and what happens um, here in Washington and elsewhere, down in Richmond, um, but there's no good answer to that right now. The other thing I think is interesting, just the diversity, the, uh, in our school systems, there are more than 120 languages spoken in the homes of, of the students. New York City is the only place in the country with anywhere with that type of a number. It's an amazing thing. My wife who works at the public health department doing immunizations, they have to have uh, this huge ability to take in um, both docu medical documents, be able to translate them from all these languages, um, and deal with the families and things. You know, what's the third most spoken language of the families in the Alexandria City Schools? The third most spoken? Yeah, it's English, Spanish. Yeah, I think you've forgotten because you've told me this. I think it's, uh, it's what, uh, Amharic the, from Ethiopia. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, that's right. Yeah, there's, a, there, well, there, there's, yeah, yeah. There, there's over 75,000 Korean Americans in Fairfax County. It's just an amazing type of, the, so that diversity that he's talking about. And that's also going to help with housing because we're going to have this really mixed and it's going to be different types of people in different types of homes and I think it'll help with that. One of the things that's really interesting about our immigrant population, which is also different from most places in the United States, is uh, I, I mean, it's essentially like uh, in, in terms of their educational level, it's like in our class. Uh, a lot of the top lot at the bottom, not the kind of you know, distribution across the continuum that you find in the United States. But there, uh, the foreign-born population, the adult foreign-born population of Northern Virginia has a higher percentage of college graduates than the people who were born in the state of Virginia who live in Northern Virginia. And it's, it's over 40-some percent. Uh, nationally, the, uh, uh, the percentage of the adult population with college or higher is at like 28%. But we have two jurisdictions, Arlington, Falls Church, that have 70%. 40% of their adult population has an advanced degree. You don't find this anywhere. Uh, I've got, we've got some students working with us from Worcester, Mass. About 26% of Worcester Mass residents have college degrees. 40% of some of these have advanced college degrees. It's just an amazing thing. Wait, I'm sorry. One, Other questions? Time for one more. Uh, uh, in terms of building and development that's synergistic with airports and anchor institutions of areas, the aviation industry, which you talked about the three different levels in terms of the planning process that you're engaging, one of them being the business community. I imagine a huge piece of that is the aviation industry in itself. And that's been an industry that's changed drastically over the last five to ten years with mega mergers. We have another pending one now. U.S. Airways, after their last merger, relocated out of Crystal City, out to Arizona. Has there been any evolve? What's kind of been the change for <laughs> development around Dulles and U.S. Airways and uh, Reagan National in light of kind of the aviation industry changes? Reagan National hasn't had a whole lot really that has been driven off of that. The changes in, in Crystal City has been when the military moved everybody out into force protected areas, into the Mark Center, into um, Belvoir, into Quantico and elsewhere. So the, the vacancy rate in offices in Crystal City was like 40% or so, if not higher for a little while. It's down some now. Um, there's like a three building complex, basically a city block that is sitting empty that the owner is looking, deciding what to do. They're probably going to tear down these buildings that were built in the 60s and put up kind of a more modern type of thing on that whole city block. Um, they've just finished renovating, renovating two full buildings that are completely emptied out in that area. So that's what's driving it there, and not as much the airlines. It'll be really interesting to see what the merger now does. And if they've got to give up some gates, who's going to come into um, Reagan National to serve that? And, and you know, if some of the lower cost airlines are going to come in there, 
um, it may change the dynamics of that, and actually it may help the area around um, around there and, and make people want to have a little better access. Dulles is another thing. It's united and united and united. Um, you know, actually, there is much, much more than that, but united is the big one. And because of that, um, there's not as much competition on fares, and so they're pretty happy. Uh, Dulles is not a cheap airport as far as the landing fees and things because of, of just the nature of how it got developed. Um, but United is, 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 we think, is reasonably happy there because of that. Um, and all across the country,